Welcome everybody to Mill City Church. We are so glad to have you with us. Why don't you find your chair and we'll continue worshiping together. <clears throat> Merry Christmas, everybody. Will you pray with me as we look at the scripture this morning? Jesus, we thank you for always being present with us. No matter where we are, you say whenever we're gathered together, we can count on your presence. And so we gather this morning because of you. We gather to worship you. We gather to hear from you. We gather to receive the gifts that you have to offer to us. So in these next few moments, God, help, help us open our ears, open our eyes to hear and see the things that you want us to hear and see. Encourage us, God. Remind us of who you are. And send us back into the world that you love to be part of the things that you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome again to Advent. And a special welcome to those of you who are visiting because you wanted to watch your kids sing or your grandkids sing or your friend's kids sing or whatever. Wasn't that fun? They did an awesome job. Ashish and the team did an awesome job getting them ready. Advent is the season where as a church we're waiting on the gifts that God wants to give us. We're waiting for the gift of Jesus Christ. And so we're having a conversation this month about waiting well. And as is the custom, we're also lighting these various candles as we go through the Advent season. And as you heard, today we, we lit the candle that represents joy. And the angels who announced Jesus' birth uh, when he was born, they said, this is good news of great joy that will be for all people. And so today we want to talk about what, what is this good news and why is it full of joy? And as we're waiting for the gifts that God wants to give us, how do we wait with joy? Even if it seems like the gift isn't coming as soon as we would like it to. So I want you to close your eyes. As Jen says, this is a, this is a really fun community time question. I hope you actually talked about what you do when you get a gift that you don't want. Just close your eyes for a second. Imagine you're in a community of people that you love, that you like, and someone's given you a gift, and you're opening it, okay? You're opening it, and you are seven years old, okay? And you realize as you're opening this gift that it is something that you already have. It is a toy that you already possess. What, what are you going to say to the people who gave you the gift? Remember, you're seven years old. What are you going to say when you open that gift. Anybody? I already have this one. Thank you so much. That's the right answer. When you're seven, you say, I already, I already have this one. Now, you're 40. Someone gives you a gift that you already have. What should you say? Thank you so much. That was such a thoughtful gift. Right? Sometimes the gifts that we get are not the ones we want. And sometimes we get gifts that maybe we have already received before, and we're forced to figure out what am I going to do as a response uh, when this happens to me. Advent is about waiting, and we want to talk about waiting well with joy. What is it that you are waiting for this Christmas, all the silliness aside? What is it you're hoping God will do in your life, in your relationships, in your workplace, in the personal struggles that you're facing, in the world that we live in? What is it that you're hoping that God will do? And how can we wait well with joy for the gifts that God God wants to give us? This is the core question for the morning. How do we wait well with joy for the gifts that God wants to give us? So to, to dig into this question today, we're going to look at a couple different biblical texts. We're going to start in the book of Isaiah. So if you have a Bible and you want to open to Isaiah chapter 35, you might say, why in the world are we reading Isaiah in December during Advent? Some of you come from traditions, Christian traditions, like Catholic or Lutheran or Episcopalian or Presbyterian, and you grew up, maybe when you were in church, 
and you were used to reading what's called the lectionary. Raise your hand if you know what the lectionary is. Okay, some of you do. The lectionary is uh, some predetermined readings that happen from different parts of the Bible on every Sunday morning. And one of the lectionary texts for this morning is Isaiah chapter 35, the whole chapter. So we're going to take a look at that uh, as we try to answer this question about how to wait well with joy. When Jesus was born and the angel and the angels announced his birth, the Israelites had been waiting for hundreds of years. But what exactly were they waiting for? Let's start there. Before we figure out how to wait with joy, let's figure out what were these Israelites actually waiting for. The context of Isaiah 35 is that Israel and Judah, who have separated out into separate countries over some disagreements, are both under siege. They're being attacked by different nations, Assyria, Babylon, and other groups during this period of time when the book of Isaiah has, uh, is writing about. So here's what it says in Isaiah 30, 35, and it's describing this gift that they're waiting to receive. As you listen to me read it, think about how would you describe the gift that's coming through in this text? What is it that these folks are waiting for God to give them? Verse, verse 1, 35. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool. The thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there, and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. This is in the midst of some really difficult times where they're unsure of their identity, they're unsure of their safety, they're unsure of their family's future. And this beautiful poetic imagery of the gift that they anticipate God giving them is written down for them in Isaiah chapter 35. I want to highlight four things quickly that, that it seems like they anticipate as gift from God, okay? The first thing is that in various parts of this chapter, you hear the restoration of their land as part of what they're waiting for God to give them. They, they want the land to produce the fruit that they need to live. They don't want scorching sun. They want trees to shade them. They don't want to have to worry about droughts and famine. They want the farmlands to produce the food that they need. And they know that that's a gift that God can give them, and they want that land that God promised to them when they came to it to produce milk and honey and provide for them and for those around them. So they want the restoration of their land. They're waiting for that. They're also waiting for physical healing. Did you hear that in the chapter? They're waiting for persons who can't hear to be able to hear. They're waiting for persons who can't see to be able to see. They're waiting for people whose bodies are not working the way that God designed them to work to be restored. They expect that physical healing will be part of the gift that God gives to them. 
they expect, and the third thing is, that they expect salvation from their enemies. They expect protection and salvation from their enemies. They expect God to come and rescue them from these threats, these external threats that have come in, the, in their lives. They're afraid, it says in the text. They have weak knees. They need God's presence to come and reassure them that God is going to protect them and save them from their enemy. And fourth, they, they describe in some detail this highway. They just call it the way in this, in this poem. And the way leads to Zion, and only the people that are redeemed by God can walk on this way to Zion, which represents God's presence. And all the people can walk safely without fear of any lions or anything coming to get them. They can walk directly into God's presence on this way. That's part of the gift that they're hoping and waiting for God to give them. And then in verse 10, it says that because of receiving all these things, they will be crowned with everlasting joy, that gladness and joy will overtake them or overwhelm them. Have you been overwhelmed with joy lately? Have you been overtaken with gladness? Well, you can imagine if they anticipate these things, that the people they love would be healed, that the land that God had given them would be restored, that they would be protected and saved from these external threats, that they would have a clear path that they know they could all enter into God's presence, they might be overwhelmed with joy, right? This is what they're waiting for. This is what they're hoping for. And they have particular ideas of what that gift is going to be like from God. Now, The reality is they don't get this gift. They don't get it. Instead, the way the history goes, they suffer from drought and they don't always have enough food. Many of the people they loved died from illness and disease. They were ultimately conquered by the Babylonians and dragged off into exile, having the temple, which was representing God's presence to them, completely destroyed. And even when they came back from Babylon, when God brought a remnant of people back, they rebuilt the temple. And when they rebuilt the temple, they wept over it because it was so sad, because it was so small compared to the one that they had before they left. They didn't get the gift. This amazing, beautiful poem that we have in in Isaiah 35 doesn't come to fruition for the people who heard it from this prophet. They don't see it. Now, by the time Jesus was born, these folks, their descendants, had been waiting at least 600 years for this poem, this gift, to become reality. So how do you wait with joy when the thing that you're waiting for seems to never come? Anybody have that experience? How do you wait with joy when the thing that you're waiting for seems to never come. How in the world did the Israelites continue to wait for God to send them a savior for 600 years? Wouldn't you just give up and stop waiting? Probably some people did give up, don't you think? Don't you think there were some gatherings where people just said, it's not gonna happen. There's no savior coming. God's forgotten about us. You can keep waiting if you want, but I'm done. I'm gonna do something else. God's not going to show up. Then on the whole, the Israelite community would return to their story, would return to the things that they knew were true about who God was and what God had done in their lives, and they would remind each other, no, God is the God who brought us up out of Egypt. God is the one who did rescue us from Babylon and bring us back to the land that God promised to us. God is the God of our ancestors, Jacob, Isaac. They knew that one day God promised to save them from their enemies. And somehow, through the community of faith that they lived in, they managed to still trust the character of God, even though for 600 years, they didn't see the Savior that they were waiting for. Do you know how long 600 years ago? How much? 1419. Anybody know what was happening in 1419? I don't. I didn't even look it up. That was a long time ago. 600 years. 
If you've been waiting a long time for something and you're not sure that it's ever going to come, the very small encouragement I want to give you today, and we all want to give you today, is that we can remember who God is, we can trust God's character, and together we can believe that even when we don't see the things that we're hoping for, God's still going to bring them. This is a core part of Christian faith through the centuries, is that even when our current circumstances don't reflect the thing that we know that God has promised us, it doesn't mean we can't trust God. And you as an individual might not be able to do that today because you're very frustrated with God or you've been waiting too long. And that's why so many times the worship leaders say to us, maybe we have to sing that song for each other today. Because you know there were people in the Israelite community who gave up on this. And yet, the gift was still coming, wasn't it? We have the benefit of hindsight now. We know that that gift was coming. The shepherd's announcement, good news of great joy, which will be for all people. This gift was kind of like the gift that you open up and say, I already have that one, or I didn't want this, or I wasn't sure that this is really going to meet the needs that I have. A poor baby to a poor family, forced to flee the country as a refugee, did not seem like a powerful king that God had promised to send for over 600 years, right? And as Jesus grew up, he didn't really meet the requirements for leading the nation of Israel into revolution and overthrowing the Roman government and reestablishing Israel's power and dominance in the world. In fact, he's just a rabbi, and he collects 12 guys who are mostly teenagers and seem to have almost no clue what he's talking about most of the time. He has no army. He has no political ambitions. He seems to stink as a politician. For many, Jesus doesn't seem like the Savior King that God had promised for so many years. We get to the story in Matthew 11, which is another reading in the lectionary text for today. And in Matthew chapter 11, we have this story of John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, who's known Jesus since he was born, who's in prison. He, he has a really good idea that he's going to die in prison, that he's going to be killed for challenging King Herod and for being friends with Jesus. And he sends this question to Jesus that every time I read it, I find heartbreaking. He sends this question to Jesus as he's facing death through his disciples. He says, guys, go and ask Jesus this question for me. Come back and tell me what he says. Here's what the question is in Matthew chapter 11. He says to Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? John's very simply saying to his cousin, did I get everything I've done wrong before I die? Would you be honest with me and tell me? Are you the one, are you the gift that God is planning to give us or is someone else going to come? Can you imagine what Jesus felt when he heard that question from his cousin? This guy's terrified. He's about to lose his life and he wants to know, is this the gift that God intends to give, or should we, should we wait for someone else? Sitting in prison, John has these doubts, and we can't blame him for those doubts, can we? Jesus responds to John's disciples. He says to him, he says to them, go back and tell John, report what you've seen, what you've heard. See if this sounds familiar to you from Isaiah 35, okay? Jesus says, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who doesn't stumble on account of me. Jesus is telling John what's happening, but John already knows those things, doesn't he? He already knows that Jesus has been healing people and restoring sight and bringing people back from the dead. Jesus is very intentionally, you can miss this here if you don't get the context, He's very intentionally saying to John, his cousin, I'm the one they're talking about in Isaiah 35 and other places in the Old Testament. This is it. I'm the gift that people have been waiting for for 600 years. He uses the same categories in Isaiah 35 to address the same hopes for the gift that the people had 
so many years before. They just didn't look like what the people expected. So if you think about these four categories with me one more time, Jesus doesn't just want to restore the land to Israel. He wants to restore all of creation. He doesn't just want to give the Israelites back their slice of the world. He wants to restore and intends to restore and recreate all of God's creation to the intended uh, design and created order. He doesn't just want to offer physical healing to the Israelites. Jesus offers physical healing to anyone who has faith in him, doesn't he? He doesn't just want the Israelites to be physically restored. He wants the whole of the world to be physically restored. He doesn't want there to be sickness or death. He wants to offer salvation not only for the Israelites and protection against their enemies, but anybody who has faith in Jesus Christ, even Jesus' enemies, can experience the salvation of Jesus Christ, can be forgiven for their sins, can be welcomed into the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't just want to provide a highway to the temple for people to walk on. He says, I actually am the way the truth, and the life. And if you believe in me, you will find yourself in the presence of God. And that's open to anybody, not just the people who can physically get to Jerusalem and go in the temple. Jesus is blowing up all of the categories that they had for this gift that they waited for for so long. The land is the whole earth. The healing is for everyone. The salvation is not limited to the Israelites, but is open to anybody who has faith in Christ. Jesus opens the door to all of us being invited and welcomed into God's presence, not just those who could physically enter a temple. Wow, the gift that God had in mind was so much bigger than what we read in Isaiah 35, wasn't it? And the character of God, not to come and destroy Israel's enemies, but to actually offer salvation to Israel's enemies. They wouldn't have been able to grasp that 600 years earlier. God gives us this very different gift than the one that was expected. So different that even John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, had to say, is this it or should we keep waiting? This is not the Savior that they were expecting. He's not even the Savior that most of them wanted. But God's plan was different than they imagined. And God's gift was greater than the one that they anticipated. The more the earliest Christians understood this gift of Jesus, because it was hard to grasp, the more they got it, the more joy they experienced. Not because they were rich, not because they were safe, not because they were powerful, but because they realized that nothing could separate them from the love and presence of God. Nothing. No enemy, no access to a temple, no physical deformity, no social status. Nothing could prevent them from entering into God's presence through faith in Jesus Christ. Nothing. And so they had joy. Waiting with joy comes from trusting the character of God, even when our circumstances aren't going the way that we want them to. And when you listen to this story, I hope that it gives you confidence this morning to say that the God that we worship, the God of the Bible, the God that's writing this story, knows how to give way better gifts than the ones we can ask for. No matter what our circumstances are now, we can trust that God will fulfill his promises and make the wrong things right. Amen? Even when we don't receive what we are hoping for or expecting, the one who promised us is still faithful. The one who promised us is trustworthy. Let me invite the band to come back up. And I can think of so many times in my life when I wished God would have acted more quickly. Anybody else? I can think of so many times in my life when I, I wanted God to answer my prayers and it didn't seem like the answer was coming. Anybody else? I even quit praying certain prayers for a while because I really didn't know that God was going to answer any of them in the first place. Anybody experience that? But what I think we can learn from the Israelites and from John the Baptist this morning is that waiting isn't just about changing our circumstances. It's about shaping us as people. It's about shaping our character. And it's about learning to trust God's character 
even when one, what's right in front of us doesn't match the future that we know God has in mind for us. Ultimately, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ is that every wrong is made right. James chapter 5 says, we wait patiently like a farmer is waiting for the harvest to come in because we know that the day of Jesus' return is near. And when Jesus returns, the land will be restored. Every physical illness will be healed. We will be protected and saved from our enemies. Our enemies will be saved from us. Those who have faith in Jesus Christ can enter into the kingdom of God fully and never worry about ever shedding another tear or battling another illness or another disease or going in the wrong direction or experiencing anything that's outside of God's will. And we will all live every single day in the presence of God with no interruption. That's the gift that God has offered to us. Let's pray. Jesus, we wait with anticipation for your return. Sometimes that is not in our consciousness. It's not at the top of our mind, God. But we remember this morning that you are coming back. That all the problems that we face in our world, God, that you know them, you care about them, and you will address them. And so as we work our our best to be part of the things that you're doing day in and day out, we also wait for you. And we wait with joy because we know who you are. We know your character. We've seen your story play out. And we can't wait for that next chapter to come. When all the injustices of the world are undone. When all the sins are forgiven. When our faith in you is rewarded with eternal life in your presence. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.